Section 3 of A Dozen Ways of Love Thrift The end of March had come. The firm Canadian snow roads had suddenly changed their surface and become a chain of miniature rivers, lakes interspersed by islands of ice and half-frozen bogs. A young priest had started out of the city of Montreal to walk to the suburb of Point St. Charles. He was in great haste, so he kilted up his long black petticoats and hopped and skipped at a good pace. The hard problems of life had not as yet assailed him. He had that set of shoulders that belonged to a good conscience and easy mind. His face was rosy-cheeked and serene. Behind him lay the hillside city, with its great towers and spires and snow-clad mountain. All along his way, budding maple trees swayed their branches overhead. On the twigs of some, there was the scarlet moss of opening flowers. Some were tipped with red buds and some were gray. The March wind was surging through them. The March clouds were flying above them, like gray clouds with no rain in them, veil above veil of mist, and each filmy web traveling at a different pace. The road began as a street, crossed railway tracks and a canal, ran between fields and again entered between houses. The houses were of brick or stone, Poor and ugly, the snow in the fields was sodden with water, the road. I wish that the holy prophet Elijah would come to this Jordan with his mantle, thought the priest to himself. This was a pious thought, and he splashed and waded along conscientiously. He had been sent on an errand, and he had to return to discharge a more important duty in the same afternoon. The suburb consisted chiefly of workmen's houses and factories, but there were some ambitious looking terraces. The priest stopped at a brick dwelling of fair size. It had an aspect of flaunting respectability. Lintel and casement were shining with varnish. Cheap starched curtains decked every window. When the priest had rung a bell, which jingled inside, the door was opened by a young woman. She was not a servant. Her dress was fur below and her hair was most elaborately arranged. She was, moreover, evidently Protestant. She held the door and surveyed the visitor with an air that was meant to show easy independence of manner, but was, in fact, insolent. The priest had a slip of paper in his hand and referred to it. Mrs. O'Brien? he asked. I'm not Mrs. O'Brien, said the young woman, looking at something which interested her in the street. A shrill voice belonging, as it seemed, to a middle-aged woman made itself heard. Louise, if it's a Catholic priest, take him right to your grandma. It's him she's expecting. A moment's stare of surprise and contempt, and the young woman led the way through a gay and cheaply furnished parlor, past the door of a best bedroom which stood open to shoe the frills on the pillows, into a room in the back wing. She opened the door with a jerk and stared again as the priest passed her. She was a handsome girl. The priest did not like to be despised. Within his heart he sighed and said a short prayer for patience. He entered a room that did not share the attempt at elegance of the front part of the house. Plain as a cottage kitchen, it was warm and comfortable withal. The large bed with patchwork quilt stood in a corner. In the middle was an iron stove in which logs cracked and sparkled. The air was hot and dry, but the priest, being accustomed to the atmosphere of stoves, took no notice. In fact, he noticed nothing but the room's one inmate who from the first moment compelled his whole attention. In a wooden armchair, dressed in a black petticoat and scarlet bedgown, sat a strong old woman. Weakness was there as well as strength, certainly, for she could not leave her chair, and the palsy of excitement was shaking her head. But the one idea conveyed by every wrinkle of the aged face and hands, by every line of the bowed figure, was strength. One brown toil-worn hen held the head of a thick walking stick, which she rested on the floor well in front of her, as if she were about to rise and walk forward. Her brown face, nose and chin strongly defined, was stretched forward as the visitor entered. Her eyes, black and commanding, carried with them something of that authoritative spell that is commonly attributed to a commanding mind. Great physical size or power this woman apparently never had, but she looked the very embodiment of a superior strength. Shut the door. Shut the door behind ye. These were the first words that the youthful confessor heard, and then, as he advanced, You're young, she said, peering into his face. Without a moment's intermission, further orders were given him. Be seated. Be seated. Take a chair by the fire and put up your wet feet. 
It is from Father McLeod's of St. Patrick's Church that you've come. The young man, whose boots were well soaked with ice water, was not loth to put them up on the edge of the stove. It was not at all his idea of a priestly visit to a woman who had represented herself as dying, but it is a large part of wisdom to take things as they come until it is necessary to interfere. You wrote, I think, to Father Malloy, saying that as the priest of this parish of French and you speak English, some current of excitement hustled her soul into the midst of what she had to say. T'was Father Maloney, him that has St. Patrick's before Father Malloy, who married me. So I just thought before I died I'd let one of you know a thing concerning that marriage that I've never told to mortal soul. Sit ye still, and keep your feet to the fire. There's no need for a young man like you to be taking your death with the wet, because I've a thing to say to ye. You are not a Catholic now, said he, raising his eyebrows with intelligence as he glanced at a Bible and hymn book that lay on the floor beside her. He was not unaccustomed to meeting perverts. It was impossible to have any strong emotions about so frequent an occurrence. He had had a long walk and the hot air of the room made him somewhat sleepy. If it had not been for the fever and excitement of her mind, he might have not picked up more than the main facts of all she said. As it was, his attention wandered for some minutes from the words that came from her palsied lips. It did not wander from her. He was thinking who she might be, and whether she was really about to die or not, and whether he had better ask Father Malloy to come and see her for himself. This last thought indicated that she impressed him as a person of more importance and interest than had been supposed when he had been sent to hear her confession. All this time, fired by resolution to tell a tale for the first and last time, the old woman, steady as much as she might her shaking head, and leaning forward to look at the priest with bleared yet flashing eyes, was pouring out words whose articulation was often indistinct. Her hand upon her staff was constantly moving, as if she were about to rise and walk. Her body seemed about to spring forward with the impulse of her thoughts. The very folds of the scarlet bedgown were instinct with excitement. The priest's attention returned to her words. Yes, Mary and Mary and Mary. That's what you priests in my young days were forever preaching to us poor folk. It was our duty to multiply and fill the new land with good Catholics. Father Maloney, that was his doctrine, and me a young girl that come out from the old country with my parents, and six children younger than me. Hadn't I had enough of young children to nurse, and me wanting to begin a life in a new place respectable and get up a bit in the world? Oh yes. But Father Maloney, he was on the lookout for a wife for Terry O'Brien. He was a widow man with five little helpless things, and drunk most of the time was Terry, and with no spirit in him to do better. Oh. But what did that matter to Father Maloney when it was the good of the church he was looking for, wanting O'Brien's family looked after? O'Brien was a good kind fellow, so Father Maloney said, and you'll never hear me say a word against that. So Father Maloney got round my mother and my father and me, and married me to O'Brien, and the first year I had a baby, and the second year I had another, and so on and so on, and there's not a soul in this world I can say but that I did well by the five that were in the house when I came to it. Oh, house! Do you think that it was one of the house he kept over our heads? No, but we moved from one room to another, not paying the rent. Well, and what we sort of a training could the children get? Father Maloney, he talked fine about bringing them up for the church. Do you come in and wash them when I was a bed? Do you put clothes on their backs? No, and fine and angry he was when I told him that that was what he had ought to have done. Oh, but Father Maloney and I went at it up and down many a day, for when I was wore out with anger inside me, I'd go and tell him what I thought of the marriage he'd made, and in a passion he'd get at a poor thing like me teaching him duty. Not that I was ever more than half sorry for the marriage myself, because of O'Brien's children, poor things, that he had before I came to them. Likely young ones they were too, and handsome. What would they have done if I hadn't been there to put them out of the way when O'Brien was drunk, knocking them round, or to put a bit of stuff together to keep them from nakedness? Well, said Father Maloney to me, why isn't it to O'Brien that you speak with your scolding tongue? Fay, and what good was it to speak to O'Brien, I'd like to know? Did you ever try to cut water with a knife, or to hurt a feather bed by striking it with your fist? A nice good-natured man was Terry O'Brien. I'll never say that he wasn't, except when he was drunk, which was most of the time, but no more backbone to him than a worm. That was the sort of husband Father Maloney married me to. 
The children kept a-coming till we knighted them. That's with the five I found ready to hand. And the elder ones getting up and needing to be set out in the world. And what prospect was there for them? What could I do for them? Me, always with an infant in my arms. Yet twas me and no other that gave them the bit and sup they had, for I went out to work. But how could I save anything to fit decent clothes on them? And it wasn't much work I could do, what with the babies always coming and sick and ailing they were half the time. The sisters would come from the covenant to give me charity. Twas precious little they gave, and lectured me too for not being more submiss. And I didn't want their charity. I wanted to get up in the world. I'd wanted that before I was married, and now I wanted it for the children. Likely the girls the two eldest were, and the boy just beginning to go the way of his father. She came to a sudden stop and breathed hard. The strong old face was still stretched out to the priest in her eagerness. The staff was swaying to and fro beneath the tremulous hand. She had poured out her words so quickly that there was in his chest a feeling of answering breathlessness. Yet he still sat regarding her placidly with the serenity of healthy youth. She did not give him long rest. What did I see around me? She demanded. I saw people that had begun their life no better than myself getting up and getting up, having a shop maybe, or sending their children to model school, to learn to be teachers or getting them into this business or that. And mine with never so much as knowing how to read, for they hadn't the shoes to put on. And I had it in me to better them and myself. I knew I'd be strong if it wasn't for the babies, and I knew, too, that I'd be doing a kinder thing for each child I had, to strangle it at its birth than to bring it on to know nothing and be nothing but a poor wretched thing like Terry O'Brien himself. At the word strangle, the young priest took his feet from the ledge in front of the fire and changed his easy attitude, sitting up straight and looking more serious. It's not that I blamed O'Brien over much. He just had the same sort of bringing up himself and his father before him. And when he was sober, a very nice man he was. It was spiritedness he lacked. But if he'd had just more spirit in this, he'd have been a wickeder man. For what is there to give a man sense in a rearing like that? If he'd been a wickeder man, I'd have had more fear to do with him the thing I did. But he was just a good sort of creature without sense enough to keep steady, or to know what the children were wanting. Not a notion he hadn't, but they'd got all they needed, and I had it in me to better them. Will he dare to say that I hadn't? After Terry O'Brien went, I had them all set out in the world, married or put to work with the best and all they've got ahead. All but O'Brien's eldest son, every one of them had got ahead of things. I couldn't put spirit into him as I could into the littler ones and into the girls. Well, but he's the only black sheep of the seven, for two of them died. All that's living but him are doing well. Doing well, she nodded her head in triumph, and their children are doing better than them, as ought to be. Some of them ladies and gentlemen. Real quality. Oh, you needn't think that I don't know the difference. Some thought expressed in his face has evidently made its way with speed to her brain. My daughter that lives here is all well enough, and her girl handsome and able to make her way, but I tell you there's some of my grandchildren that's as much above her in the world as she is above poor Terry O'Brien. Young people that speak soft when they come to see their poor old granny and read books. Oh, I know the difference. Oh, I know very well. Not but what my daughter here is well to do, and there's not one of them, all but has a respect for me. She nodded triumphantly, and her eyes flashed. They know, they know very well how I set them out in the world, and they come back for advice to me, old as I am, and see that I want for nothing. I've been a good mother to them, and a good mother makes good children and grandchildren too. There was another pause in which she breathed hard. The priest grasped the point of the story. He asked, what became of O'Brien? I drowned him. The priest stood up in a rigid and clerical attitude. I tell ye, I drowned him. She had changed her attitude to suit his, and with a supreme excitement of telling what she had never told, there seemed to come to her the power to sit erect. Her eagerness was not that of self-indication. It was the feverish exaltation with which old age glories over bygone achievement. I never had thought of it if it hadn't been O'Brien himself that put it into my head. But the children had a dog. Twas little enough they had to play with, and the beast was useful in his way too, for he could mind the baby at times, but he took to ailing. Like enough it was from want of food, and I was for nursing him up a bit and bring him round, but O'Brien said that he'd put him into the canal. Twas one Sunday he was at home sober, 
for when he was drunk I could handle him so that he couldn't do much harm. So I says, and why is he to be put in the canal? Says he, because he's doing no good here. So says I, let the poor beast live, for he does no harm. Then he says, but it's harm he does taking the children's meat and their place by the fire. And says I, are you not afraid to hurry an innocent creature into the next world? For the dog had that sense he was like one of the children to me. Then said Terry O'Brien, for he had a wit of his own. And if he's an innocent creature, he'll fare well where he goes. Then says I, he's done his sins like the rest of us, no doubt. Then says he, the sooner he's put where he can do no more, the better. So with that he put a string round the poor thing's neck and took him away to where there was holes in the ice of the canal, just as there is today, for it was the same season of the year, and the children all cried, and I thinks to myself, if it was a dog that was going to put their father into the water, they would cry less, for he had a peevish temper in drink, which was most of the time. So then, I knew what to do. T'was for the sake of the children that were crying about me that I did it, and I looked up to the sky and I said to God and the holy saints that for Terry O'Brien and his children, t'was the best deed I could do. And the words that we said about the poor beast ring my head, for they fitted to O'Brien himself, every one of them. So you see, it was just a time when the ice was still thick on the water, six inches thick maybe, but where anything had happened to break it, the edges were melting into large holes. And the next night when it was late and dark, I went and waited outside the tavern, the way O'Brien would be coming home. He was just in that state that he could walk, but he hadn't the sense of a child. And when we came by the canal, for there's a road along it all winter long, but there were places where if you went off the road, you fell in, and there were play cards up saying to take care. But Terry O'Brien had the sense to remember them. I led him to the edge of a hole, and then I came on without him. He was too drunk to feel the pain of the gasping, so I went home. There wasn't a creature who lived near for a mile then, and in the morning I gave out that I was afraid he'd got drowned, so they broke the ice and took him up. And there was just one person that grieved for Terry O'Brien. Many's the day I grieved for him, for I was accustomed to have him about me, and I missed him like, and I said in my heart, Terry, wherever you may be, I have done the best deed for you and your children, for if you were innocent you have gone to a better place, and if it were sin to live as you did, the less of it you have on your soul, the better for you. And as for the children, poor lambs, I can give them a start in the world now that I am rid of you. That's what I said in my heart to O'Brien at first, when I grieved for him. And then the years passed and I worked too hard to be thinking of him. And now, when I sit here facing the death for myself, I can look out my windows there back and see the canal, and I need to say to Terry again, as if I was coming face to face with him, that I did the best deed I could do for him and his. I broke with the Catholic Church long ago, for I couldn't go to confess, and many's the year that I never thought of religion. But now that I'm going to die, I try to read the books my daughter's minister gives me, and I look to God and say that I have sins on my soul. But the drowning of O'Brien, as far as I know right from wrong, isn't one of them. The young priest had an idea that the occasion demanded some strong form of speech. Woman, he said, what have you told me this for? The strength of her excitement was subsiding. In its wane, the afflictions of her age seemed to be let loose upon her again. Her words came out more thickly, her gaunt frame trembling the more, but not for one moment did her eye flinch before his youthful severity. I hear that you priests are at it yet. Mary and Mary and Mary, that's what you teach the poor folks that will do your bidding, in order that the new country may be filled with Catholics, and I thought, before I died, i just let you know how one such marriage turned. And as he didn't come himself, you may go home and tell Father McLeod that God help me, I have told you the truth. The next day, an elderly priest approached the door of the same house. His hair was grey, his shoulders bent. His face was furrowed with those benign lines which tell that the pain which has given them is that sympathy which accepts as his own the sorrows of others. Father Gmeloyd had come far because he had a word to say, a word of pity and of sympathy, which he hoped might yet touch an impenitent heart, a word that he felt was due from the church he represented to this wandering soul, whether repentance should be the result or not. When he rang the bell, it was not a young girl but her mother who answered the door. Her face which spoke of ordinary comfort and good cheer, bore marks of recent tears. Do you know, asked the father curiously, 
What statement it was that your mother communicated to my friend who was here yesterday? No, sir, I do not. Your mother was yesterday in her usual health and sound mind? He interrogated gently. She was indeed, sir, and she wiped a tear. I would like to see your mother, persisted he. She had a stroke in the night, sir. She's lying easy now, but she knows no one, and the doctor says she'll never hear or see or speak again. The old man sighed deeply. If I may make so bold, sir, will you tell me what business it was my mother had with a young man yesterday, or with yourself? It is not well that I should tell you, he replied, and he went away. End of section 3